wonderful time of worship. And Lord, the praise was just precious this morning. And Lord, we thank you for the blessings that's ours to be able to gather with others and worship you and praise you. And Lord, what a strong word from our pastor this morning. And Father, I pray it will speak to our hearts today. So Father, as we open your word now to study, I pray that our hearts and minds are open and that our spirit is willing and our heart is already yes to whatever you have to say to us today. So thank you, Father, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You thought he'd come out with a gold robe on or something? Or? <laughs> All right. We go, we're going to be in Ephesians today. And Ephesians is written really in uh, two parts. Chapters 1 through 4 deal with what I'll call doctrinal issues. One through three. And four through six deal with uh, Did I put the wrong reference in the email? I guess nobody reads it except Laquetta. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, so basically, anytime you're approaching Ephesians, you'll see these this division. First three chapters, doctrinal issues, where Paul is really just nailing down certain doctrines and beliefs. And then he begins to make practical application uh, of these doctrinal truths. Now, uh, to me, that's how almost any uh, sermon or message or even a, a Bible class, that's how it ought to work. We ought to be able to nail down some basic principles, but if then if we don't make any application of those, we may have learn something, but if we can't apply the principles and the precepts of the Word of God, then oftentimes our endeavors are just that. They're, they're just something we do, rather than something that really impacts our life. So as Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, we see uh, this kind of uh, issue. Ephesians 1. I'm almost there. Okay. Here I am. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Where is Paul while he's writing this? Yeah, he's in jail in Rome. So this is one of what we would call one of Paul's prison epistles. And he is writing this because by now, by now, at least in the heart and mind of Paul, the message of Jesus Christ encompasses or is to encompass the whole world. And as he has expanded his personal ministry, you know, we've already studied about the, the four journeys that he took. The last one, of course, taking him to Rome. But he has basically uh, engulfed the whole world in his mindset concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It is to go to all people, to all men. Now, you remember when Paul was saved and, and uh, God called him, what his call was uh, to just take the gospel and to share the gospel. And, and so, who did he go to first? Everywhere he went. And I heard this morning, Paul, everywhere Paul went, uh, he visited two places. A synagogue and a jail. So, who were the first ones Paul would always go to wherever he went? The Jews. Okay? Now, he loved the Jews, right? He was a Jew. And he loved the Jews. He even said on one occasion... I'd be willing to give up my salvation if it would mean that all of Israel could be saved or would be saved. He loved Israel and the Jews that much. So they, even in our last lesson, we studied where there were some that were beginning, the Jews, he went to the Jews, they were arguing with Paul, they were hard-hearted, so Paul said, I'm going where? Who am I going to now? The Gentile world. And most of the time when you see the word Gentile, it is the heathen world he's talking about. The, the, the unbelieving world. And he uses that reference many times. Now, we will find later as we, as we go on down through this part of this, that when Paul talks about the Gentiles uh, and, and the condition of the Gentiles, these, a lot of these people in Ephesus were Gentiles. They weren't Jews, but they were believers. So he will use the reference Gentiles often simply to talk about the unsaved world, the unsaved people, uh, the ones that, that maybe he would have called the heathen people, the unbelieving people. And that was Paul's heart, was to take the gospel to the Jews first, then to the Gentile. Now, Paul faced three different groups. Brother Steve mentioned a couple of them in his message this morning. Of course, the Jews opposed him uh, with their traditions and their uh, religious practices. Uh, the Greeks opposed him. Uh, one of the... one of, and, and Paul, if you read his account in Acts where he went to uh, Athens, there was a, a, a particular kind of belief called Gnosticism. And that's where the Greeks were. It was all about knowledge. It was all about knowledge. And so, as Paul delivered the gospel, they rejected it because to them, it was just another idea. Even in Acts, it says, they said, we want to hear more about this later. Because they had the desire to hear some new thing. So among the philosophers and the Stoics in Athens, Paul encountered Gnosticism, directly opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gnosticism is a religion of works, a religion of study, a religion of knowledge. It has nothing to do with grace. So he was opposed by them. And of course then, the Judaizers. You remember he had a hard time with them. The Judaizers were Jews who had become converted to Christianity, but they still wanted to pull in the Jewish rites, R-I-T-E-S, into and add it to the gospel of grace. So that was a problem for Paul. So he addressed these. And now he faces the Romans. <coughs> Let's do a little background. Uh, we don't necessarily have to turn there. We'll turn to Acts chapter 20. And we'll come back to Ephesians in just a moment. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> in Acts 19, Paul is arriving at Ephesus. He stayed there almost three years. He stayed over two years and almost three years uh, when, he, when he got to Ephesus. As was his custom, he began teaching in the synagogues. But after being maligned, you remember we studied this, we, we read about this, where he left the synagogue and he began to call people together down at the school of Tyrannus, or the hall 
of Tyrannus. You remember we talked about that and we studied about that. And so uh, it was also in uh, Ephesus that he met great opposition, you remember, from the silversmiths who made images of the goddess Artemis or Diana as it's called in different places. And uh, he caused a riot there. But in, in Acts 20, starting in verse 17, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. Now remember this, Paul has called the elders of the church to come and meet with him and all, all the way down then to verse 38. He's giving them instructions. These are the elders, the pastors, the shepherds from the church of Ephesus. Paul is in Miletus. He calls the elders of the church at Ephesus to come to him and he begins to share with him. Look at part of what he says. Uh, verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each of you with tears. So he talks about to these elders that are going back to Ephesus. He instructs them and encourages them and, and warns them about what's going to take place. Now, uh, let's go back to Ephesus. <clears throat> Ephesians, rather. Ephesians 1. Now, in uh, Paul writes his letter to the Ephesians, and it was probably a circular letter. Uh, probably a letter that was circulated among many of the churches. Uh, now there's some cause uh, right now again he's in he's in prison uh, now there were uh, basically three different things that Paul had to encounter at Ephesus now remember this is not one of his times when he just comes and goes he's there for three years and he encounters various issues in the church at Ephesus. Now we got to remember this is the first century church. This is the first century church. What did we say last week? How long had it been after the crucifixion? About 30 something years after the crucifixion of Christ. The church was young. The church was very young, very small. And even in the first century church there were issues that came up that created problems uh, in the church and the spreading of the gospel. One of these was he had these heathen religions to, to reckon with in Ephesus. It was a town of paganism. It was a town where there was the, the huge temple to the goddess Artemis. And so it was, a, it was a heathen kind of place. So he had to encounter that. I well remember... I well remember the first time Faye and I went to Haiti. And as we walked up one of the streets in Port of Spain, Port au Prince, we saw up over up on one side a business place where they could come, people could come and get their uh, whatever they needed for witchcraft. Uh, there were jars, I'm talking about a jar that tall, uh, with a neck on it probably about that big, but the jar was like that big around, and it was full. It was full of, uh, of some kind of liquid. I guess it was formaldehyde. I don't know what else it could be. And inside were scorpions and frogs and chicken heads and chicken feet and all kinds of things that they would use in their rituals. And you're talking about spiritual oppression. I mean, you could just feel the, 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 the pressure, the spiritual oppression upon your chest. It was that thick. It was that strong in, in a place where this is the way of most people. 
And Paul is in Ephesus, and this is a place where they worship a goddess that they said the image of the goddess came down from heaven, fell out of the sky. So he's got to encounter that. And don't tell me that, that you can't feel evil, because you can. You can. Uh, one of the times that I, I encountered it, and, and I don't want to offend anybody, but there were some of us walking up a sidewalk. We were going into Graceland in Memphis, and I felt such spiritual oppression. I didn't go. I just let the others go on in. Now, you may love Elvis. I don't know, but it was, it was a, a spiritual oppression. Now, he had to encounter that. He had to encounter internal divisions and bickering in the church. Bickering about different things. Arguing about different things. Now there's always a place in the church for differences of opinion. But when it becomes divisive, when it becomes divisive, it's not of the Spirit of the Lord. So there always has to be, everybody has to be able to express, but if everybody is led by the Spirit of God, there is no division, right? There is no discord. So, there's something awry there. The Christians with Jewish heritage, these Judaizers, these Christians that were Jews, feel superior to the Gentile Christians. They feel like they've got an advantage over them because they were Jews. Now, thirdly, in this city, in this pagan heathen city, Take a Christian, put him in the midst of something like this. Don't you know it was a strong temptation to them to be lured back into the world and to the practices of the ungodly people in Ephesus. So therefore, these first century churches, these first century Christians had a choice. They could do like a lot of people do. They could try to stand with a foot in both worlds. Serving the Lord, yet living like the world. You know anybody like that? One foot in Jesus, the other foot in the world. And by the way, that's impossible because nobody can stretch that far. Nobody can stretch that far. But that was one of their options because the, here these Christians are a little tiny conclave of people in the midst of all of this heathenism, in the midst of all of this ungodliness. So they could maybe do both. That was one of their options. Secondly, they could just pull off to themselves and go build them a monastery and just stay over there. That was a, third, a second choice. The third choice that they faced was to live as the people of God and face whatever came. Be true to their salvation and their relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul was encouraging them to do the latter. Because the spread of the gospel, listen, this is so crucial. The spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ rested upon how the Christians in Ephesus lived their lives. This, let me say it again. The spread, the ongoing spread of the gospel rested upon how the Christians in Ephesus lived their daily life. And dearly beloved, the same thing is true of us today. The ongoing of the gospel of Christ depends upon how we, as Christ followers, live our lives each day. That's heavy stuff. That's heavy stuff. A lot going with it. Brother Steve talked about having a gift and then the responsibilities that come with that. Well, the gift, of course, is our salvation in Jesus. But then responsibilities come with that. Responsibilities come with our salvation. Now, the 
first 14 verses of the first chapter of Ephesians is really a prayer of praise. And it's a beautiful, a beautiful prayer of praise. There are a couple of things here I just want us to touch on. Brother Steve hammered it pretty hard. Uh, well, let, me, let, let, let me read. And you, you, you're, uh, I'm reading out of the New American Standard, uh, and it's, this is not the the New American. The, it's not the new New American Standard version. <laughs> uh, it still has the these and the thous in it. Uh, this this old Bible. Uh, I think it goes back to about 1970, somewhere along there. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us to Adoption as sons through Jesus Christ himself, according to the kind intention of his will. Now you move on down, uh, verse uh, 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind in intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ things in the heavens and things upon the earth, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Now, one of the, one of the uh, gravest issues that the church faces today, and when I say the church, I'm talking about the Southern Baptist denomination is the issue of Calvinism. Now, I want to say this right. The basic premise of Calvinism uh, is that God predetermined everything that was going to be beforehand. Now, there's a difference in uh, predestination and what we want to call foreknowledge. Now, I could spell predestination, but I'm not going to try. There's, there's, from the very beginning, did, did, did God know who would ever be saved? That's not His predestination. That's His foreknowledge. God knows everything. Now, the Calvinist would say, and he would use this limited atonement which means basically that Jesus died only for the elect and that God has predetermined who the elect are how does what Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the Calvinist view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. To me, God said, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if that was in prison after being a serial killer, praise the Lord. You know, that it's not God's will that any should perish. Whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You know. 
Exactly. If God knows everything, God has foreknowledge. But He did not beforehand predetermine, predestined who would be saved. Look at these words again. Verse 5. He predestined, which means He originally intended. It's been the predetermined will of God for us to experience adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. God is always predetermined, predestined that we would become His children through His Son, Jesus Christ. But look at that latter phrase in verse 5. According to the kind intention of His will. What is the will of God? It is not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And in case you never heard me say it before, there are no contradictions in the Word of God. So if that be true, predestination, as far as the Calvinist is concerned, cannot those two things cannot coexist. Now, down in verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined predestined according to His purpose. Whose purpose? God's purpose. We have been predetermined, predestined according to His purpose to work all things after the counsel of His will. He is predetermined that all should live according to His will. When Jesus was asked by the disciples for Him to teach them how to pray, the last part of that prayer says, Jesus said, this is how you ought to pray. May Thy will be done according, work all things after the counsel of His will. Jesus said, pray like this. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, the will of God is unrestricted, unfettered in any kind of way in heaven. God's will is perfectly done in heaven. And Jesus said, as you pray, pray this. Pray like this. Father, may your will in heaven be done on earth. You imagine a world where the will of God is unfettered and unhindered? You're talking about the millennium, Harold. Sure, that's, that's, yes, yes, that, that is the, the, the core belief of Arminianism, which we would follow, but opposite to Calvinism. In Calvinism, the choice has already been made. Now it's a matter of just calling out the elect. My question to a Calvinist would be, if God's already decided, why are we going to send missionaries? Well, they would say, we're going to send missionaries in order to call out the elect. To call them out. Well, that's where the work of the church comes in. If, if they're already determined and you call them out, then that's the church. And that's the body that's going to continue to spread and call out others of the elect. That's the job of the church in the hyper-Calvinist views. Now, we're, we're chasing a rabbit right here. And uh, we're going to run him right in the hole. 
uh, and just move on. Uh, the thing that Paul is trying to determine here, and um, and by the way, what I've said about Calvinism is a terrible oversimplification of the doctrine of Calvinism. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I'm a three-point Calvinist, uh, but I do not believe in limited atonement. I do believe in the total depravity of man. I do believe in the perseverance of the saints. In other words, if you're ever saved, you're going to always be saved. So there, there's three points of Calvinism, and I, right now the third one doesn't come to mind. But uh, the, the, the idea is that Paul is presenting to the church at Ephesus, because remember, he's dealing with issues already in the first century church. He's already dealing with issues that are, that are creating division and discord and this is one of them. And he's helping them to understand this is what God has already predetermined and predestined for you to be and for you to, to live like this. He's setting down the doctrine of the fact that Jesus died for everybody and he wants everybody to be part of the family of God because that is according to his will. That's according to his will. Now, go over to uh, chapter 4. Now we're getting into application. Um, what do you think when Brother Steve come out there with that old ragged coat on? Huh? We knew what? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But wasn't it a wonderful illustration of what he was talking about? You know, that, that this is, as Harold said, this is the choice. We've already made the choice to be saved. Now, is that forced on us? No. But the Spirit of God, Jesus said, no man can come to the Father except he's drawn. So the Spirit of God convicted our heart at some point in our life, made us understand that we were lost. That we were a lost sinner. And then somebody told us about Jesus. Or maybe that was all done in the same thing. But then the Spirit of God drew us to receive Christ as our Savior, repent of our sins, confess Him as our Lord and Savior. That was a choice. Now like Brother Steve said, God had already done everything needed in order for us to be redeemed. All of that was already in place. He sent His only Son lived a perfect sinless life, died on a cruel cross, buried in a barred tomb, rose the third day, ascended back to heaven. <coughs> All of that was in place. It was already done. Now, you're presented with that truth. The Spirit of God draws you in your heart. Then it's your, what do you do with that? Some people reject it. Some people reject it many times as the Spirit draws them. But somewhere, probably for you, at some point along the way, you said, yes. Yes, I want to be saved. I believe. I believe. I confess. Yes, I am a sinner. I confess. And I repent, which means I go the opposite direction. And we call on the name of the Lord. And the Word says, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's nothing added to that. That's a choice. We make the choice. Then comes, how do we live after that? What difference does that make in our life? You don't hear that word much anymore. Now we may we may see that second one and say, "Well, oh, he's a character," you know. But what about character? What about integrity as the people of God? Uh, and it it doesn't have to do with uh, some kind of super spirituality. It is a matter of the committing of our will. 
It is the matter of surrendering of our will. Now, he goes on here in chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And he's giving some instructions in righteousness. I entreat you, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling from which you have been called. With all humility. Gentleness. These are characteristics. Characteristics. That's close. These are characteristics of one who has been born again. Now, he's also saying these are the characteristics of those within the body of Christ. Not only individually are these things to be true, but collectively these are to be true. Humility, gentleness, patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Unity. One body, one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. <clears throat> Verse 11. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. Some people put a, just a slash in between those. It, it's the same thing, a pastor, teacher. For the now, now look at what the pastors and the evangelists and these others are for. What are they supposed to do in the church? Equip the saints. Equip for the equipping of the saints. For what? For works of service. To equip the saints for acts or works of service. To the building up of the body of Christ. So you see the administration of the church, how it's supposed to be. Now that does not mean that the pastor teacher or the evangelist are not supposed to do works of service. Doesn't mean there that we're exempt from sharing Jesus with others or or exempt from anything that anybody else would be required to do. But the work the main work of the pastor teacher is the equipping of the saints. Equipping them so that they can do service in the kingdom. God gave to the church. Paul is sort of describing his own or, or making known his own uh, what am I trying to say? His job description. This is his job description. Now I've been a pastor since 1963 and I've encountered a lot not so much verbally, but by attitude, that that's what we hired you to do. That's what we hired you to do. You you go you go knock on the doors in the community. You go win the lost. You go visit the sick. You go you go you go you go. That's what we hired you to do. The only thing any church ever called me to do was to equip the saints. For the works of ministry and to try to create unity. See, that's. We're what? Yeah, I don't know nothing about none of the rest of them. Yeah. I don't know how all those others do. But this has been something that I've experienced all these years and still do. That's right. That's right. But some of them got messed with and then now there's something else beside Baptist. I think that's what Mr. Holman's point is. 
you must realize, Roger, there are some in here who are not Baptists. You can't. They, they can't help it. <laughs> All right. All right. That went down a hole too, so let's move on. For the equipping of the saints, verse 12, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. It's a process of growth, isn't it? It's a process of growth. When Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And when we are born again, we are, as Paul said to the church at Corinth, we are babes in Christ. And he said that to their detriment because he said, some of y'all are still nursing babies. You've been saved a long time, but you're still nursing the bottom. You can't handle the meat. You still got to have milk and he implored them to, to grow and, and that is that is our our task and, and again here's the choice we've got choices everywhere don't we Harold? this is a choice we can stay as a babe in Christ feeding on the milk acting like babies Look down at verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children, babies, tossed here and there by waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Grow. Grow up. grow up because there's no way that great commission is going to be accomplished if we stay babies we've got to grow how do we grow well sure it is that's right he says until verse 13 until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Knowledge. Where does knowledge come from? It comes from studying. It comes from the Word of God. This, this is God's Word. This is breathed by the Holy Spirit of God. And how often have I said, and I experience this, and I, I, I just say it this way because that's how it is in my life, it's like it's in layers. And he'll reveal a deeper layer. You say, well, what? I've read that hundred. I never saw that. I never real. I never saw that truth there. And he continues to peel back the layers to take us deeper and deeper. Not just so we can be some kind of super spiritual person, but so that we can have the knowledge of God. And grow up into maturity. Mature Christians. What are some of the signs of a mature Christian? Verse 15. We speak the truth in love. We are to grow up in all aspects unto Him. Who is the head, even Christ. Grow up. Now, I'm not a, I'm not, don't follow my example because I'm fat. But how do we nourish our bodies? By what we eat, right? How do we grow our bodies? I was telling somebody the other day, yes, uh, I think it was our oldest son asked me something about how, what did I weigh when I got married? And I told him, I said, I think about 150 pounds, but I wasn't full growed then, you know. <laughs> but now I'll be full growed, you know. 
But in that, it, we grow by what we feed on. And the same principle is absolutely true in the spiritual life. We grow by what we feed on. What do we feed on? If Ooey gooey. That's right. I love that. We understand this. There's no nothing true, I mean, new to us. That we know this stuff. We know this. We've heard it over and over and over all our life. But somehow, we have to do what Pastor was talking about and what uh, Paul is talking about here in verse 24. Put on the new self. But in order to put on the new self, we have to take off the old self. And that's a choice. That's a choice. Are we ready to give up and cast aside these things that hinder us in our walk with Christ? Are we ready, as he says there in verse 23, to be renewed in the spirit of my mind? Am I willing to even let the Spirit of God transform how I think? To transform my mind? To transform my thought life? Am I willing? Am I willing? Because He says He will if I'm willing. Romans, Paul said, don't be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world. That's a choice. Do not any longer be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed, there's the choice, by the renewing of your mind. I can't renew my mind, but I have to surrender my mind and let the Spirit of God continually transform and renew my mind. My mind is flawed. My emotions are flawed. I'm part of broken, sinful humanity. So I can't trust my carnal mind. He has to transform my mind. Renew my mind. It's all a process of growing. Growing in our maturity, in our, in our knowledge of God in our commitment to the Lord, in our service to the Lord, we grow. We grow. No, you're making perfect sense. I, I, you know, I've heard people say, well, He changes you want to. You know, when, when Jesus comes into our heart, it cha He changes my want to. Uh, and, and this is part of the process of that. And good gracious, I wish I had a penny every time I've said this. He changes who I am, and then that changes what I do. And the person that says, I'm not going to trust Christ because I've got to change what I do then they love what they do more than they want to be saved. Now Paul mentions that in uh, uh, verse 17. This, this I say therefore and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles or the heathen, heathens also walk in the futility of their mind. In the futility of their mind being darkened in their understanding. That's the lack of knowledge being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality, there's a choice. They've given themselves over to sin. But you didn't learn Christ that way. So put off the old garment. Put off the old self. And put on the new self. 
That's the choice. That's the choice. Because Paul is dealing with these issues in the church, but they are issues in individuals' lives. <clears throat> Changes you want to. Yeah. All right, I got just a minute. Let's go to Titus for just a minute. Titus chapter 1. Thank you, Suzanne, for, for this. And uh, Again, any of y'all that, that want to be on the email list and are not, give me your email address. And uh, I'll make sure you get it. Or try, try to make sure you get it. <clears throat> now, in Titus, again, he's laying down basic doctrinal truths. Uh, which is always Paul's way. Uh, to Titus, verse 4. My true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. For this reason I left you in Crete that you might set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. You remember he's done this. He's done this everywhere he's been. He has put in certain leadership called of God. Namely, if any man be above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer, also could be translated bishop, the overseer must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed. Now, I've met and known some terribly hard-nosed Baptists. I mean hard-nosed, hard-hearted. I mean, you better be you know, you, you, you better meet my qualifications. And they'll start talking about, and that you see this in Titus, and also in Timothy, uh, where Paul talks about the, the uh, qualifications for a deacon, where he talks about the qualifications for a deacon's wife, where he talks about the qualifications of an elder. And people will pick out certain ones and say, you can't be that if you're this. But they don't ever deal with some of the smaller things that says he can't be self-willed. See, we're nominating deacons right now. You're being asked to nominate deacons. You say, well, he meets this requirement, that requirement, but is he self-willed? Is he quick-tempered? says he's not supposed to be quick-tempered. Not addicted to wine. I told you about the deacon that drinks his beer on vacation. See, we, huh? <laughs> One more. Not pugnacious. You ever known any? P <laughs> That's another word for hard nosed, Reggie. <laughs> Not fond of sordid gain. But he has to be hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, that he may be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those in, uh, who contradict. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, the Judaizers. But as for you, chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, Titus. Speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. 
Older men are to be temperate. We got any of them in here? Maybe not. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, <laughs> sensible. <laughs> Sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Older women. <laughs> uh, older women, likewise, are to be <laughs> reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips. You say, well, I can gossip without being malicious. <laughs> no, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine. <laughs> uh, margarita every now and then is okay, I guess. <laughs> You, you got to take charge of the wine bottle, Danny. <laughs> in order, now this is why they need to be this. In order that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible in all things. Show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is above reproach, in order that the opponent, the enemy, may be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Sound doctrine, living with integrity and character, following the Lord Jesus Christ, growing in our faith, growing in our knowledge. That's the will of God. For every one of us. It's true in Ephesus. It's true with Titus. It's just as true today. That's the will of God. For the, li for the life of all of us. Who know Christ as our Savior. That's the choice. To take off. Set aside the old self. Put on the new self. That honors and glorifies Him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this uh, time together in your word. And Lord, I know your spirit has spoken to my heart through it. Uh, not only, Lord, in preparation, but even today. And I thank you that your word is always true. It always penetrates the heart. And it is always like a two-edged sword. But Father, we don't, we don't wield the sword. Your spirit does that. And we praise you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Mel.